In this video, I'll be covering how to use a BLE sniffer to capture and analyze BLE communication. And specifically, today we'll be focused on advertising packets. Hey guys, Mohamed Afani here from Novelbits, and on this channel, I help developers and engineers learn about Bluetooth Low Energy and how to develop for this technology. So what is a BLE sniffer? Well, formally, it is referred to as a Bluetooth protocol analyzer, and it's a device that can passively scan and listen in on communication between two BLE devices within its direct radio range. If we were to classify the different BLE sniffers in the market, Market, we put them into three categories. The first are BLE sniffers that are based on BLE development kits. So a vendor would provide a special firmware that would run on one of their development kits in order to sniff the BLE communication going over the air. Usually the special firmware that the vendor provides to run on their development kit in order to operate as a BLE sniffer is closed source and they do not give you access to their source code. So they pro just provide a binary that you can run on the development kit. Also most commonly these BLE sniffers that are based on development kits are usually a single radio so they can only tune into one radio channel at a time. This means that it can be hard and sometimes difficult to track devices and scan all the advertisement channels and be able to follow a connection very effectively. The pricing for these kinds of BLE sniffers can range from the cost of a development kit such as $30 up to maybe $100 or so and some more specialized such as the Obertooth one. Second are high-end commercial solutions that are targeted more at customers that are highly invested in BLE. These BLE sniffers are software defined radio based, meaning that they can capture the full Bluetooth spectrum. So that means that they can capture multiple advertisements coming in at the same time, as well as capture connections across multiple devices. The pricing for these types of BLE sniffers can range significantly. Some of them the low, at the low end can cost about $8,000 and they can go all the way up to maybe 70 or $80,000, depending on the configuration and the features enabled by the vendor. For example, some of these will be able to capture Bluetooth Classic at the same time, as well as Wi-Fi and 802.15.4 traffic. Examples of these sniffers include ones from Elisys or Teledyne LaCroix, formerly known as Frontline, as well as some new ones in the market, such as the Panalyzer from Spanalytics. The third type of BLE sniffers are not as common anymore, but some of them used to utilize three or four independent BLE chipsets in order to be able to track the three primary advertisement channels, as well as maybe follow one connection in addition to that. The majority of BLE sniffers operate in a way that would require them to be connected to a computer. On the computer side, the vendor would provide an application that would be the interface to the BLE sniffer in order to control it, as well as visualize and capture the data that is captured by the sniffer to display it to the user in a user-friendly way. In the case of the development kit-based BLE sniffers, those usually utilize Wireshark instead of the vendor having to develop their own Windows or PC application to interface with the BLE sniffer. There are a couple of main benefits to using a BLE sniffer. And the first one is obvious, and it's to be able to debug communication between two BLE devices to find out what kind of issues is going on. The other benefit to using a BLE sniffer, and is really the topic of this video, is to be able to get an in-depth understanding of how BLE works and take a look at the packets even down to the byte and bit format. So today I'll be using a sniffer from Elsys called the Elsys Tracker. This device is a very compact device that has a lot of capabilities. It's a BLE sniffer only, that means it cannot capture classic Bluetooth. However, it can capture Wi-Fi as well as 802.15.4 traffic. This device costs anywhere between maybe 10,000 all the way up to 20 or $25,000 depending on the configuration that is usually just software based. So in terms of BLE devices, we'll be using a Nordic Thingy 52 and its companion mobile app, and I'll be using it on iOS. Now, if you don't know what the Thingy 52 is, it's a great little compact multi-sensor prototyping BLE platform that's based on the NRF52 chipset. It does contain a rechargeable battery, so you don't have to worry about changing batteries there. It contains LEDs, a programmable button, accelerometer, temperature sensor, and a lot more. So once I have the Thingy running, I can now start to capture on the BLE sniffer. And you'll see there's a bunch of different devices being discovered. What I'm going to do is find the thingy. I just need to involve thingy and that will filter out everything else. So now that we have the advertisements from the thingy showing in this capture, 
we can expand and we'll see a bunch of different advertisement packets. So I'm going to stop the capture so we can look at the details of the packets. So let's pick this packet, for example, or this is actually a sequence of packets. And if we look at the sequence of packets, we'll see on the right side here in the details pane, you'll see a lot of information. There's the link layer information and the link layer packet itself. The link layer information is metadata or properties of the packet that's being captured. In this case, we can see that the RF channel index is 37. As you know, BLE 37, 38, and 39 are the channels that are being used for primary advertisement channels. We can also see the phi that's being used, LE1 mega phi, and that's the most common used by devices. The access address, which is a fixed address. We have the initial seed for the CRC and the physical channel, and that's the advertisement. And if we look at the link layer packet, this is the PDU and the payload included in the advertisement packet. We can see here the header and then the advertisement data itself. If we refer back to the spec, and I have here the core 5.3 spec, we can go to page 219. And this is what the packet format for the LE uncoded files looks like. This is the general packet information if we want to dig in and look at the, the specific advertisement channel packets. We can go to page 2672, I believe. And in this case, this is a packet format for the LE uncoded FIs. And let's look for the advertisement channel packets. And here in section 2.3, the advertising physical channel PDU. We have a header and then a payload. And these are the fields within the header. So we look, we can see the PDU type, which is the, in this case, is the advertisement type. RFUs reserved for future use. There's a channel selection algorithm bit, the transmitter address, and a receive address. And these are whether it's random or static. And then we have the length of the payload that comes after that. So if we go back to the sniffer capture, we can see the PDU type in this case is the advertisement indication, which is the most common advertising packet that allows connections from other devices and allows scanning, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The channel selection algorithm is number one, which corresponds to a bit set to zero, and that is the legacy algorithm. The TX address is random, and the payload length we have is 35 bytes. Now, one important thing here in the sniffer is that we can actually look at the raw data. So if we look at the header, we can look at the raw data here and you can actually configure it to show hex or character or decimal in the left area and the right area separately. I have it configured to show the hexadecimal values here and the binary and the bit values on the right side. So in this case, the header is 4023. And if we go back to the spec, we can see that the header starts from, in this packet format, starts from the least significant byte and goes all the way up to the most significant byte. So we'll start with the least significant byte and we can know, we know that the PDU type is there. This is here. So the least significant four bits in this packet in the header correspond to the PDU type. And in the case of advertising indication, this is set to 0000. zero, zero, zero. So the lowest in this byte are going to be four zeros, followed by another zero, which corresponds to the RFU. This is reserved for future use. It's always set to zero. We have the channel selection. In this case, the channel selection algorithm is the legacy channel selection. And if we go down to advertising indication, PDU, here it will tell us exactly what the value should be. It will be set to one only if the channel selection algorithm is the number two one, not number one. In this case, we're using number one, so this is set to zero. And then we have the TX address set to one. TX address, if we go back to advertising indication, is set to one only when it's random and set to zero when it's public. 
In this case, this is random, so it is set to one. And then the last bit, is the Rx address, which is not used in this case. And so it is set to zero. The next part is the payload length. And in here it's 23 hex, which converts to 35 bytes. Now let's look at the payload. We have the advertisement address. And in this case, this is six bytes and it's set here. It's a static address. And following that is the advertising data. Now, before we look at the advertising data, it's important to see what the structure of the packet is. The advertising data structure is defined in the spec, page 1357. This is the advertising and scan response data format. And so the advertising data can contain multiple structures, multiple different types of fields. For each one of these, it starts first by the having one byte of the length. In this case, we have flags, we have service UIDs and we have local names. So we have three different types included in the advertisement packet. For each one, we have a length, one byte, and this tells you the length of the data that follows it. The data contains one byte of advertisement type, and then it also contains the data after that. Now, once you look at these, you can see there's flag, service UIDs, and local name. Those are not actually defined in the spec but you have to refer to something called the supplement to the Bluetooth core specification document. And in this, you'll find the different data types, definitions, and their formats. So if we go back and if we go to look at flags, we'll see this is the, these are the different flags that can be set. In this case, we have LE general discoverable mode set. BREDR is not supported, so that's set to true. So these are the only two flags that are set. The rest are zeros. So if we look at them here, we'll see this is the byte 06. The significant bit in this case is zero, then bit one and bit two are set to one. So if we go here, we see this is only one octet, bit zero, bit one and bit two. The LE general discoverable mode is set to one and BREDR not supported is set to one which matches what we're seeing here in the sniffer. And then we can also refer to the supplement to the Bluetooth core specification document, and we can look at the different types. We have service UIDs. It can include 16-bit, 32-bit, or global 128-bit. In this case, it is including 128-bit, which is 16 bytes. And you can see that here in the raw data format. The last one that we have here is the local name. And we can see that here. You can include either a shortened local name or a complete local name. So one thing we forgot to explain is where the type comes from. So if we look back here at the advertisement data type, within the data we have something called AD type. And if we look at flags, for example, in this case it is one and that's occupied by one byte. And in order to find that and find the different values, you need to refer to a document called the assigned numbers. If you look at the Bluetooth website, there is a section under specifications that refers to assigned numbers. And for the advertisement type, we need to refer to the generic access profile document. Once we open this document, we can see the different types of assigned numbers. And so the type value in this case is 01, which refers to flags. So if we go back to the sniffer capture, 01 refers to flags. Let's see, what would service UUID be? So if we go and find the service UUID, there's different ones. There's incomplete list, there's a complete list for 16-bit, 32-bit, and 128-bit. I think in this case, it might be either the incomplete list or the complete list. So let's see which one it is. Is it 06 or 07? And if we go back, look at the service UIDs, the length, and then 06. So this is actually an incomplete list of 128-bit service class UUIDs. And this sniffer also tells us that and says more available. If this was complete, this would not be there. So now that we understand the different types of data that could be included in the advertisement packet, one thing we notice here is there's a scan request and scan response. 
And the reason a device would use a scan request or support a scan request and sending out a scan response is to include more data that can't be fit within the advertisement packet, the primary advertisement packet. So in this case, the thingy device, when it advertises, it actually conveys to the other device that it supports a scan request. And this is this is relayed through the use of the advertisement indication type. So once the device receives the scan request, the scan response here contains the regular, the normal headers that we see for the PDU, as well as a PDU type. So in this case, there's a scan response data that is accompanied by manufacturer specific data. And that's the only data type that's included here. If we go back to that assigned numbers document, if we look for the manufacturer specific data, and that should be FF. If we go back here, the first one is the length, that's seven bytes, and then FF. So that matches what we found. And in this case, we have a company ID. The company ID here is set by the Bluetooth SIG and it's defined publicly. And you can actually find that in the Bluetooth assigned numbers as well. So if we go back to that website and we look at company identifiers, you'll see a list of the companies and their identification values. We can do a search for Nordic and we can see it's 0059. If we go back to the sniffer capture, we can see that the company ID is 0059, just like we saw. And then there's manufacturer specific data, which is irrelevant for us. It's specific data that Nordic wants to include in the advertisement packet. And that's it for today's video. In the next videos in the next few weeks, we'll be covering more on connection requests, GAT discovery, GAT operations, and we'll also look at other sniffers in the market, such as the NRF sniffer that is based on a development kit. If you've enjoyed watching this video and you found it helpful, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to be notified when the new videos in this mini series come out. And I'll see you guys in the next one.